Assassin's Creed Rogue launched in November of 2014 for the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3, alongside Assassin's Creed Unity, which launched on next-generation consoles. This meant that Assassin's Creed Rogue was always going to play second fiddle to Assassin's Creed Unity, a game which had an all-new lighting engine, was much bigger and badder, at least on paper, compared to Rogue, and was dealing with the next generation of hardware, so naturally it was far more interesting, intriguing, and exciting, which meant that many people aren't even aware that Assassin's Creed Rogue exists and was a full-fledged Assassin's Creed release. But it was, and it launched on the exact same day as Unity for old generation consoles, giving people who had not bought the next generation of consoles something to play in the Assassin's Creed franchise without having to buy an Xbox One or a PS4. Now, as we all know, Assassin's Creed Unity was met with a lot of blowback when it initially launched due to its technical issues. Even today, the game still is phenomenally beautiful and rivals many games launched even today in 2018 with its lighting engine. However, it still, to this day, faces glitches and bugs and simply was not given enough time and effort and care to polish it correctly. Now, one might think that this would be good for Assassin's Creed Rogue, because many people would look at it and see it as the true Assassin's Creed release of that year. But instead, what happened is that many people simply got fed up with Assassin's Creed, and Unity served as the proof positive that Ubisoft was releasing too many of these titles concurrently. Indeed, Assassin's Creed Rogue eventually became the sticking point that many people could look at and accuse of taking away much needed development time, effort, and money and resources from Assassin's Creed Unity, effectively killing the game before it was ever launched. Now, to be fair, in all reality, this isn't necessarily a direct correlation. Correlation does not always equal causation, and in this regard, it's true that Ubisoft released Rogue and Unity at the exact same time. However, the games were developed by completely separate studios and teams, and were in development for a fair amount of time before that. While it is true Ubisoft rushed Unity out, it isn't necessarily true that Rogue caused Ubisoft to push the game out. It's, it's not necessarily correlated. Now after all of this, Rogue was left basically in the shadows and forgotten. Many people didn't realize this was a game and all of the hype and attention and hatred was aimed towards Unity. People were fairly fed up with the franchise and just wanted something good, polished, and fun and they were starting to get burnt out, which eventually led Ubisoft to taking a year off in 2016 to work on the much more polished and ambitious Assassin's Creed Origins. But this of course left Rogue forgotten and unplayed, which is why I'm creating this video now so that we can look back at this game, see what it did differently, if it was the fan favorite that so many people remember it as being, as the actual game in the franchise in 2014 and Ubisoft was simply releasing a tech demo with Unity, or is it just more of the same and another example of what happens when a franchise is milked dry? So with that, we're going to get into it. We're going to look at the narrative. We're going to look at the gameplay and then we're going to tie it all together and figure out what this game does well, what it does poorly, and what it means and did for the franchise on the whole. As always, I have timestamps in the description box below, so feel free to jump around the video if you need to. But with all that said, let's get started. Now, to understand what Rogue does so differently and why it's so significant for the series and the developers themselves, we need to first understand what Assassin's Creed as a franchise has been doing since its inception. Now, your average Assassin's Creed game typically consists of the player controlling some sort of protagonist who has lots of abilities and powers and is themselves an assassin for the Assassin's Creed, as you would expect. You run across an open or semi-open map, killing assassinating, trailing, hunting, doing all sorts of things to occupy your time. In this respect, all of the games are fairly similar. Even Assassin's Creed Origins, the biggest buck to the trend of any game in the series, came and still pushed many of the same series tropes, albeit they were slightly tweaked and altered, but nonetheless they were still the same. Now these are all gameplay focused similarities, which to be honest is actually okay. There's nothing wrong with games in the same franchise 
guys having a lot of gameplay oriented similarities. Now, narratively speaking, it's also okay for the most part to have similar narratives going throughout. However, you have to shake it up at times in order to keep it interesting. And this is where Assassin's Creed games tend to flounder. In almost every Assassin's Creed title, you are an assassin fighting the Templar Order, trying to get a hold of some sort of artifact or item of power or get into an area which will likely have an item of power. And then you use that to control the populace and the Templars want to use it to control and eliminate free will for sake of peace, or at least their perceived notion of peace. And then the assassins want to gain these objects to prevent the Templars from getting it. Now, once again, I want to stress that this is not inherently a bad thing. If you go to see a Need for Speed film, you likely know what to expect. When I go and watch a Marvel superhero movie, I know roughly what's going to happen in that film. It's not going to be a surprise to me when there's some sort of plot twist where the good guy is actually a bad guy and the bad guy is actually a good guy and we have to twist it around and uh, rethink all of our perceived notions of good and evil and then everyone makes up and is happy at the end of it after Robert Downing Jr cracks a few jokes. I know what to expect and part of that is good because when I bought the ticket for the movie I expected that experience. All of this to say in general franchises tend to keep the mixture fairly formulaic. They found what works and they don't want to mess with it. After all if it ain't broke don't fix it. This isn't, however, to say that no one ever bucks the trend or that bucking the trend and doing something narratively different is going to result in a negative result. A perfect example being God of War. When the game was initially shown off at E3 in 2016, people were taken aback because, to be honest, God of War has always been a fairly similar experience from title to title. God of War, the original title, compared to God of War 3, was a fairly similar game. The camera perspectives were the same, the narrative approach was the same. When you sat down to play it, you knew what you were going to get and you were okay with it because it was fun. But when they announced this new revamped version of God of War, many people were frankly nervous because they had no reason to believe that this was going to be a positive change. Corey Barlog moved the camera from a more top-down isometric point of view to an over-the-shoulder, very Naughty Dog-esque camera perspective, with the entire game taking place in one fluid camera shot, something which is to be honest, kind of cool, incredibly ambitious, and something that I can honestly say I would not have thought of. The combat is completely changed, the weapons are swapped out, you now have a sidekick in the form of your son Atreus that you have to manage, take care of, and then he also helps you out. Very Last of Us-esque. It was a change to the formula that no one really saw coming, and perhaps no one even asked for, but once the reviewers got a hold of the game and started playing it, it very quickly started racking up 10 out of 10 scores because it was so phenomenally well done. All of this to say that complacency is the inherent enemy of progress. The issue with many AAA developers is that they get a hold of a AAA title or franchise that sells very, very well and it's always going to do very, very well for them, and they don't want to mix it up too much. They know what's worked in the past, so they stick with it. You can look at Call of Duty, you can look at Battlefield, you can look at effectively any AAA title that is in the best-selling titles of the year list. And that, of course, brings us to Assassin's Creed Rogue. Now, I don't want you to think that the narrative switch up in this game is anywhere near the narrative switch up that was attempted in God of War, but rather this was a, an, an attempt at flipping the story on its head, where we've always played an assassin and been forced to sympathize with the Assassin's Creed, now we get to sympathize with the Templars. We get to look at the world through their eyes, go through missions where we have to side with people in red jackets instead of the blue jackets. And it changes everything in a way that 
honestly is pretty cool. The game takes place effectively as a sequel to Black Flag, but a prequel to Assassin's Creed 3. And this means that you get to run into all of these characters that you met in Assassin's Creed 3, but earlier in life. So you run across Charles Lee, you run across uh, Haytham, you run across a younger Achilles. You encounter all of these people in a way that was honestly pretty cool and unexpected. And when you would see them in a cutscene, all of a sudden coming out casually talking to you just like they were another buddy from high school it was pretty cool because you felt like a member of the club in a way that you probably wouldn't have felt if you hadn't played the other titles now this narrative switch up for me was a pretty significant one and one that I was very glad to see and hear about back when it was initially being discussed however I never really sat down to give the game a fair shake simply because it was released in a very strange time. The console generation was moving forward, the Xbox One and PS4 were taking the world by storm, and Assassin's Creed Unity, with its many, many bugs and issues, was, at the very least, much more intriguing to a new player than what appears to be simply a reskinned and very large expansion to Black Flag. But regardless, it was a very interesting narrative tactic to employ. Flipping the enemies upside down with the heroes, at least as they've been for most of your franchise, and make the player sympathize with them and understand why they're doing the things that they're doing. This is a difficult thing to do in most titles because, as you would expect, most game developers tend to make the evil bad guy just evil and doesn't have a lot of good reasons. He's just a bad guy for the sake of being a bad guy or has bad motivations because he's got bad motivations or he's a, a power hungry maniac. But in Assassin's Creed, it's much more nuanced than that, even to the point where in games like Assassin's Creed Syndicate, I straight up sympathize more with Steric, the bad guy of that game, because I find him to be much more reasonable. The assassins, whether you like them or not, are terrorists, and it's just a matter of whether or not you agree with their tactics and what they do, and why they're doing it. But at the end of the day, they are mercenaries running around in hoodies, killing random people who are high up in political office. Whether it's for good, noble reasons is up to you to determine but they are terrorists, and so there's a lot riding on that justification. My issue with a lot of Assassin's Creed games is that they usually take this justification for granted and don't bother giving you a strong reason to sympathize with the Assassin's Order instead of with the Templar Order. In Assassin's Creed Syndicate, we're asked to sympathize with the cause of two siblings that are running around civilized London killing countless people simply because they don't want those people to continue gaining money and control. That to me is not inherent justification that I should just assume and, and take for granted. That's something that to me seems incredibly lazy. But Ubisoft tends to simply leave it at that and expect you to follow along. Now, of course, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Stark is trying to expand his business ventures and eliminate effectively free will in order to gain security, which is the age-old discussion whether you should sacrifice your freedoms in order to gain certain securities and at what point that becomes too much and at what point it can leak over and cause tyranny, which is when you have to get into the topic of corruption, which corruption is something that Assassin's Creed almost never really delves into. They mention it, they deal with corrupt figures, but they don't really delve into what's causing it or show it on any large scale. You simply are shown a bad guy who seems to be corrupt, but it's left simply at that. But that's an issue for another video. Point being, Rogue had a very interesting and special opportunity here to flip the formula on its head and give you a reason to see why the Templar's causes are perhaps sympathetic and understandable, but still wrong. And they could have given you a chance to understand why they're wrong and why these individuals are willing to give their lives for sake of this at least from what the other games show us, obvious falsity. But I'm sorry to report that Assassin's Creed Rogue doesn't really do this. They do flip the formula on its head and show how the assassins tend to be willing to sacrifice the good of the people around them for the greater good as they see it. 
but that's about it. They leave the topic there and the game very quickly turns into simply an Assassin's Creed game where instead of saying Assassin's Creed, they keep saying the Templar Order and that's about the only difference that we see. Now I know that some people will disagree with me on that. However, I honestly ask you to go through cutscenes and narrative segments in Assassin's Creed Rogue and simply substitute the name Templar Order with the Creed or the Assassin's Creed. And what you'll find is that these discussions that you are having as you go through the narrative of Rogue are almost the exact same conversations you have in any other Assassin's Creed game. It's simply swapped out. They don't actually do anything significant and different. Now that's mostly a discussion on the meta, but what about the micro? What about the smaller elements of the game's narrative and how they approach it? Well, to be honest, the game, as I said, is very similar to Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag. In fact, at many times I felt as though I was just playing a large expansion to Black Flag and not a separate standalone title. And this isn't inherently bad. Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag was for many people the the best game in the series up until Origins, and some might say it's because it wasn't a typical Assassin's Creed game, it was more of a pirating simulator with Assassin's Creed elements flown in there, but at the end of the day, it still was a fun experience. So I'm not complaining that I had the opportunity to play more of it and a slightly tweaked version of it, but I am a little bit frustrated because this game, time and time again, both narratively and in terms of gameplay, doesn't do anything significantly different. It simply rests on the series laurels and relies on a dedicated and very, very excited fan base to justify it for them. Now this of course begs the question how we should evaluate a game like Rogue. Should we evaluate it as a standalone title or as the very obvious cash grab that it was in an attempt to double down on the popularity and critical acclaim that Black Flag was met with? And I know saying that this game was a cash grab might anger a few people, but all I can say is that it released on the exact same day as the other much, much larger game that clearly was the priority for Ubisoft. This was just another game for them to throw out there on previous generation at that point, consoles, so that they could double down and increase cash flow. Business-wise, it makes sense and was a good idea, but in terms of giving players a unique and separate experience, something different from what they had experienced the year before in Black Flag, it certainly didn't do it. Now, if we accept what this game actually is, which is just an expansion effectively to Black Flag, then it's very, very good. And honestly, it's, it's pretty remarkable considering the quick turnaround and what they were able to do in the time. And narratively speaking, it's different enough that at least it feels like a slightly separated experience, even if all of the gameplay mechanics are at their core the same. And with that said, it's actually pretty easy to break down how this game will be received by individuals. Simply, if you enjoyed Black Flag, you're going to really like Rogue because it's simply more of the same. However, if you didn't like Black Flag, you weren't going to like this. Just like you're not going to like a large DLC expansion for Dark Souls 3 if you hated the core game. However, if we try to evaluate this as a standalone title, which thankfully we don't necessarily have to do, it gets a lot more messy because to be honest, at its core, as a standalone title, Rogue does not do anything differently. And if Rogue were the only game released in 2014, it would have been incredibly upsetting. Now, perhaps not as upsetting as Unity was for its own plethora of reasons, but still upsetting because it assumes that players are going to be okay with doing the exact same thing over and over and over again and will simply fork over the cash because it's more Assassin's Creed. As we saw very quickly after Syndicate, that wasn't the case. Sales were dropping and Ubisoft realized pretty quickly that they had to take a year off in order to really revamp the franchise and make it work. All of this to say, Assassin's Creed Rogue had a real opportunity here. They had a lot of potential. However, as was the case with most Ubisoft games prior to 2017, 
it simply was rushed out the door and not given its due time in order to ferment and become something truly special. I enjoyed my time with it, but that's mainly as a fan of the franchise who enjoys all of the little narrative seeds that are planted throughout and all of the little Easter eggs we get where we encounter all of these characters we'll meet in later, or in this case, perhaps past games which is really, really fun for somebody who's a fan of the franchise. However, if you are a more casual fan, it's probably not going to be enough to justify the game's repetitive nature. And all of this brings us to the gameplay. As already mentioned, Rogue really doesn't do much in way of gameplay adjustment to make the game feel special or unique in any significant way. Sure, things have been tweaked and added, such as in naval battles, it's all been polished up, the damage calculations have been adjusted and balanced so that battles on the sea feel much more fair and even, and much more like actual battles, especially in rougher waters. They've also adjusted things such as enemies being able to board your ship, so all of a sudden you become a bit of a victim in this broad Odd scheme of things as opposed to simply having an overpowered ship where you can board people but they can't board your ship. They've adjusted the trade mini game that first saw its debut in Assassin's Creed 3 so that it's a little more flushed out and at least justifiable in terms of time to commit to it because you can actually see a good return on your investment. If you balance your gameplay time correctly you can actually make a good amount of money and put that towards upgrades for your ship or for your character and really speed up progression if you are simply proactive about it. There's also several large set piece moments which I greatly enjoyed, especially a moment fairly early on in the game which serves as the critical moment in Shay's uh, transformation from a sympathetic assassin to a sympathetic Templar. And uh, I'll just let the gameplay play in the background so you can see what we're dealing with, but this is something that I didn't quite expect from a rushed out assassin Assassin's Creed title, and I welcomed with open arms, to be honest. Other than that, everything is mostly the same. A few things have been tweaked, animations have been added, certain kill moves have been tweaked and adjusted and added and subtracted. It's what you would expect. Nothing crazy new has been added or changed. It's more of the same. Hence my earlier estimation that if you enjoyed Black Flag, you'll enjoy Rogue. And if you didn't enjoy Black Flag, you aren't going to enjoy Rogue. It really is as simple as that. And this is the point in the video where I feel kind of bad because there really isn't much to say with regards to the gameplay because simply not much has changed. I could go through each and every single one of the gameplay systems in here, but I've already critiqued Black Flag. I've already discussed games like Assassin's Creed 3, so there wouldn't really be a need to go through all of these elements. And after all, I'm sure you're fairly familiar with the gameplay loop of an Assassin's Creed title. So me covering it in detail would likely just be more of a bore than an actually interesting discussion. Now, perhaps I'm wrong and perhaps I should go through all of the individual gameplay mechanics inside the title, that's something that really I'm unsure about. So I'm going to side with my personal judgment on this issue and leave it there. But if you'd like to hear more discussions about individual gameplay loops and systems with regards to sequels and follow-ups to other titles in a series, please let me know in the comments because I won't know unless you tell me. So let me know what you think of that down below. Now this of course brings us to the broader conclusion. What do we say about Rogue looking back at it in 2018? Well, to be honest, it is a game I have fond memories of and enjoyed playing through for this video, but it's not a game that I would consider revolutionary or significant enough to be played through by anybody other than diehard Assassin's Creed fans who likely have already gone through it themselves. Sometimes with these critiques, we'll encounter an older game that is such a gem, I have to recommend that you go through it because to not go through it would be a travesty and you'd simply be missing out on an experience which is worthy of playing. However, Rogue is simply more of the same. And if you aren't somebody who's going to get a kick out of all of the narrative little tidbits planted within here, 
there really is no reason. It's going to be more of what you've already experienced, and at that point, you might as well just spend your time playing through uh, the new God of War game or really any other title that tends to shake things up. Simply, it's a fun expansion for Black Flag, and if you really enjoyed that game, I recommend this one. However, if you didn't enjoy Black Flag, or if you are not a hardcore Assassin's Creed fan, it's likely best to leave this game sitting on the shelf of poorly followed through Ubisoft games where it belongs. That's about all I have. Thank you, honestly and truly, for watching. It really does mean the world to me. And if you haven't yet, consider subscribing. There's more critiques like this out all of the time. And we do live shows, streaming. We do all sorts of news analyzation. It's a blast here. So consider subscribing if you haven't. And as always, if you have any suggestions, any comments, or thoughts, concerns about this video, leave those down below in the comment section. My commitment to you as a creator is that if you spend the time to watch my content, I can at the very least commit the time equal or greater to go through and watch and read through all of your comments because after all without you this would mean nothing it wouldn't do anything it would simply go out into the ether and disappear so the fact that somebody out there is watching this and enjoying it uh, to the point where they want to continue watching is kind of crazy to me and i owe that crazy to you so honestly and truly thank you but that's all i have to say Thank you for watching. I love each and every single one of you more than you could possibly know. And I'll see you in the next video. Peace out.